Hi, everyone, and welcome to the Nairobi Ideas podcast, a podcast that gives a public platform to the Africans changing the world with their big ideas. Nairobi Ideas podcast is brought to you by the Mawazo Institute, a Nairobi-based research organization focused on female thought leadership and public engagement with research. Now, normally, this is the part where Rose would say, I'm your host, Dr. Rose Motiso. But in this episode, we get to turn the mic on her. I'll be your host, Kare Mugo, for this special episode as we meet the host and the voice behind the Nairobi Ideas podcast. Dr. Rose Motiso is the co-founder and CEO of the Mawazo Institute. She's also the research director of the Energy for Growth Hub and the current Next Einstein Forum ambassador representing Kenya. Rose has worked extensively as a researcher and practitioner focused on technology and policy dimensions of energy, environment, and innovation globally. Most recently, her work has focused on power sector issues in Africa. She is a material scientist by training with research experience in the fields of nanotechnology and polymer physics. In 2018, she added one more accomplishment to her belt, host of the Nairobi Ideas podcast. Hi, Rose. Hi, Kari. This is really exciting to get to interview you. May I just offer one um, constructive uh, criticism? Yes. <laughs> you know, the way you said I'm your host, Dr. Rosemont, so it's just not the same. <laughs> it's not the same, <laughs> You know, there's a certain like sultriness in my voice when I say it. <laughs> okay, you know what? Um, I, I look forward to handing the mic back to you. Um, <laughs> But we'll try this again. I'm your host, Kare Mugo. Yeah, you have to be like, you know, it's that it's NPR voice. Yeah, <laughs> there we go. <laughs> I'll figure it out by the end of this interview, I promise you. So in the first couple of episodes, we got to hear you sit down with some pretty interesting Kenyan scientists. And this includes Dr. Hamisi Babusa, who is a brilliant university lecturer writing Kiswahili science fiction novellas. We got to meet Susan Murabana, who is the brainchild behind the Traveling Telescope. Uh, which goes around the country giving kids a chance to see the solar system. And we also got to meet Dr. Stella Bosire, whose story of triumph from the slums of Kibera to a leading public health authority is just nothing short of inspirational. And we didn't really get to hear much about you. So I was hoping that this time around, we would kind of dig into your pretty interesting background and this very impressive, serious scientist CV that you have. So how about we... Begin at the very beginning. Why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Who were you before you became Dr. Rose Motiso? Wow, what a question. So I was born in Nairobi. I don't want to date myself too much. And I, I grew up in Lenana Road, actually. Uh, we're recording right now on Lenana Road. So uh, those days, Lenana Road was a very sleepy road. Uh, not much going on, not the, not the way it is today. I went to school at State House Primary School, which is, uh, for those of you who go to the Nairobi Aburitam, it's like a small primary school right there. Um, I went on to the Kenya High School in Kileleshwa, and then after high school, went on to the U.S. to do my undergrad degrees all the way to Ph.D. You basically go to high school, then you go to the U.S., then you have a Ph.D., then you have an institution. I think we've missed a couple of steps there. So you went to the U.S. What did you study? What were you interested in? I mean, growing up, did you want to be... The head of our research (laughs) institute. (laughs) No, no, unfortunately. Um, So when I was young, I would say probably like most Kenyans in my very early years, I probably said something like I wanted to be a doctor or something, you know, the standard. And I mean, that's a little bit disastrous because I hate the sight of blood. I cannot deal with it. So I'm really glad that I um, chose a different profession. One thing that I was always fascinated by when I was young is um, academia. So my dad was a professor and actually where we lived in on Lenana Road those days, there were a lot of the houses belonged to the University of Nairobi, which is how we ended up on the side of town. And, um, you know, all of our neighbors were affiliated with the university. And so I really grew up around so many university people, so many lecturers, professors, researchers. This was kind of the world I grew up in. And for some reason, uh, none of the other kids that we grew up with found this lifestyle particularly intriguing. But I just thought it was the best. Like you're paid to think about things, to teach. You travel the world going to conferences. You meet people from all over the world at these conferences. Sometimes they come to your house. And when they come to your house, your kids get to eat chicken (laughs) um, because it's a special guest. You know, I I just thought that this is like a fabulous life. And uh, from a young age, I did a lot of tutoring at school. I've always been very opinionated. So I like The impression I got is that when you're a professor, people listen to what you say. And so I think this was always something that once I'd gotten over my standard, I want to be a doctor phase, I knew I wanted to be a professor from a very young age. 
as far as I can tell, the kind of standard way one becomes a professor is just stay in school for a very long time, which is why my entire bio is just a lot of school. <laughs> that makes sense. I mean, I think you're probably one of the few people who's looked at professorships and thought fabulous lifestyle know. you know i want to be jet set in from one conference to another you know what you get free schwag you get tote bags with the name of the conference you get usb sticks also the name of the conference it's a really good life that's really great so for everyone listening out there um if you're looking for like really good swag bags the way to go is through uh, academia so part of this serious bio that you have where you've been in school for a very long time it lists that you are a material scientist with a research background that is focused on nanotechnology and polymer physics. I am not a scientist. So just looking at this, these things should mean something to me, but I'm not quite sure what they mean. So for the non-scientists listening, what does it mean to be a material scientist? What is nanotechnology? What is polymer physics? Sorry for loading my bio with all of this jargon. You know, actually, one of the goals of the Mawazo Institute is to make science more accessible. That's why we do this podcast, uh, slash why Kare is now temporarily doing this podcast, is to <laughs> promote public engagement with research. So I really should have done a better job breaking it down. So let me try and break it down. Please. Okay. So first, material science. Material science is simply the study of matter, and matter is the stuff that makes the physical world around us. Everything around us is matter. And so material scientists try to use uh, systematic methods to understand the physical properties of the world around us and how we can manipulate it to create new materials that have the desired properties we want. So it's an interdisciplinary field, uses tools mainly from physics, chemistry, and engineering. Classic material science is metallurgy, so study of metals. So all of the kind of steels and the metals that underpin our entire civilization for a long time. This day's uh, field has really evolved. So to include stuff like semiconductors, which underpin the entire electronics industry. This is a special class of material. Uh, you even have stuff like biomaterials now, for example, um, you know, materials that you use for hip replacement mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And so it's people who are playing around with all of this stuff so that you can have materials that can be used for different applications. As I said, materials in particular overlaps a lot with physics and particularly this field of branch of physics called condensed metaphysics, and which is why I sometimes refer to myself as an applied physicist because I was really in the physics part of material science. In my PhD, I was in a polymer physics group. So what are polymers? Part two of my <laughs> tutorial. Let's go ahead. <laughs> I'll quiz you at the end. So you now know oh what man, material I'm science is. Oh I'm taking notes. Okay. <laughs> Within material science, I was in a polymer <clears throat> physics group. Uh, so what are polymers? These are essentially large molecules, which are made of many other small molecules that are interconnected using all sorts of chemical bonds. The most common thing that you might think of when you think of a polymer are plastics. Okay. That's so that's insane. pretty ubiquitous. Everybody knows what they are. But there are also lots of natural polymers. So silk, wood, cellulose, proteins. So your hair, keratin. That's interesting. So nucleic acids like DNA, RNA, these are also polymers. Um, what I studied mainly was organic polymers, which are carbon-based, which then brings us back to plastics. So I was studying pretty everyday plastics, but I was trying to create advanced versions of them. When you're talking about everyday plastics, are you talking about like the containers I have in my house? Exactly. That I get yes. take away the plastic yeah. bags that are now banned in Kenya. <laughs> exactly. That sort of thing. Okay. That, yeah. So I was working with the everyday plastics, but I was trying to create something more high tech. Okay. Which brings me to the third part of my tutorial nanotechnology. Interesting. <laughs> so to create these advanced plastics, I use tools from nanotechnology. And nanotechnology is when we man manipulate materials at the nanometer scale. So a nanometer is very, very small. It's a billionth of a meter. So one over one zero 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 zero. Very, very small. Right. That I, I hope I, small. <laughs> I hope I did, or the nanotechnology society will kick me out. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, um, a common way that scientists sometimes put it is that a nanometer is about 100,000 times smaller than one single strand of hair. Oh, wow. And so, and an atom is maybe a fraction of a nanometer. So in nanotechnology, we're kind of working at the atomic and the molecular scale. We're manipulating materials at that level. And to do that, we need, you know, really special tools, like very powerful electron microscopes. And so... Um, at this scale, at the nanometer scale, materials have very, very special properties. And this is what we're trying to get at. We're trying to embed into normal materials some of these properties from the nanoscale to create new exciting materials. In my work specifically, I was using nanowires, which are just metal wires that are very, very, very small and nanoscale carbon fibers. Again, carbon fibers that are very, very small and we'd put them into plastics and we're trying to make the plastics 
conduct. So make them behave like a metal. Okay. So that's the kind of thing that you can do with nanotechnologies. You can take something that is a plastic that you would use in a container at home mm-hmm. and do some kind of fancy science and then turn it into something that's really cool, like a conducting polymer or conducting plastic. And then Once you have a plastic that's conducting, you can do cool things like make a flexible television. I was trying to make superpower versions of common plastics. That's what was going to be my analogy. Okay, so (laughs) is it, for instance, we're taking Hulk pre-Hulk, right? And then like infusing Hulk with like all these super amazing abilities that this human then becomes something that it wasn't before. Is that sort of the the thing we're going for with with the work that you're doing, which is how do we take something ordinary and make it extraordinary? You know, the example maybe I would give is Rapunzel with her long Ah, hair, which hair is a protein, which is a polymer. (laughs) How did her hair get so long and powerful and strong? I mean, maybe there's some nanotech there. Ah, Interesting. Okay, I like that. Then my second question, because I still have questions on this, um, is what is what is the purpose of these like new plastics we're trying to create? So the thing about plastics that I know, and I know like plastics get a bad rap. And I mean, we are later in the season of this podcast. Uh, spoiler alert, we're going to be exploring climate and conservation. And so um, I don't take it lightly that plastics in many ways have become a scourge in our society. But one thing that is really good about them is that they're cheap, they're light, they're easy to process, they're transparent. They're all of these things that you cannot get out of a traditional conducting material like a metal. And so if you can create a combo of the two where you have something that's cheap, light, transparent, but also conducting, you know what I mean? You're imparting the best of both worlds. That's the whole point. And part of my work was to also see how can we create this super plastic that's also greener to process. And so you're processing it using greener methods. I had colleagues who are working on biodegradable plastics. And so once you're doing material science, yeah, you're basically manipulating all of these materials to meet different ends. And I really like that. Um, I like the idea of biodegradable plastic. I'm very concerned about the environment. I hope you all are too. Also, shameless plug, if you have a present science question and you're not sure where to turn, if you don't have a material scientist sitting next to you who can explain what nanotechnology is to you or polymer physics, um, we, the Mawazo Institute, will actually be launching our Nairobi Ideas Explainers this August. And what Nairobi Ideas Explainers is, is, uh, is an opportunity to answer all your lingering questions about science and its influence over our world. So what we're asking is for you, our listeners, to send us your questions on social media and we will find you the answers that you need under the Nairobi Ideas Explainer. So back to you, Rose. You are currently the CEO of the Mawazo Institute, but I know that you play other roles across different institutions aside from being an energy policy expert. So if I were to ask you to describe yourself, how would you respond to the question, what do you do? That's a good one. Yeah, it's really difficult to sum sum it up, but I was thinking about it the other day in preparation for another event actually I'm participating in, and I wrote this down. I was like, okay, who am I? What do I do? So the way I boiled it down is I have two jobs. The first is I help young African women complete their PhD studies and go on to be experts who influence policy and public discourse with their ideas. So this is the work of the Mawazo Institute. That's my main job. My second job is I am myself a young African woman with a PhD in material science. I am an energy expert and I am trying to influence policy and public discourse with my ideas. That is nice and concise. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess talk to me about what you're doing with the Mawazo Institute around helping young African women complete PhD studies, because that sounds very ambitious. And what does it look like when we're actually doing this in practice? What does it mean to help somebody get to the end of a PhD journey, which I hear from other people are just grueling and, yeah. and intense? Yeah, it's not for everyone. Our intention is certainly not that every person should have a PhD. No, that would be a very awkward world in which we would all have very poor fashion. And I do not (laughs) want that to happen. Yeah, so for me, it really is a very personal journey to um, spend a lot of time sitting with um, questions and problem solving at that kind of level of depth that you do in, in a PhD program. I think what you get out of that is a couple of things. You know, one is, yeah, you get really deep subject matter expertise. You get to know a subject really well. You get to know a field really well. And as the world gets more complicated, you know, we need more and more people with specialist knowledge, you know, people who can understand complicated things and have been trained specifically for that. But a PhD also gives you a lot of like transferable uh, skills that cut across beyond academia, beyond your specific field. You know, you learn how to systematically grapple with very complicated questions and figure out, you know, step by step 
how to address them, how to answer them. Uh, you learn how to um, get up to speed on complicated questions very quickly. You learn how to synthesize and communicate your research and writing presentations. These are all the things that you have to do uh, at, at the PhD level because you have to teach, you have to go to conferences. Um, you also build a lot of resilience because it's a very hard thing to do. And so there are all of these things that come out of a PhD study that are also, aside from the expertise, are useful skills that kind of create people who can really contribute to problem solving um, in a place like Africa. And so for me, going through that journey and learning all of these things, I really felt like I would like to see more young Kenyan women, East African women like me having this opportunity to sharpen their expertise, to learn all these transferable skills, and then to go into the world and use those skills to make a difference. We are seeing so many Africans taking up problem solving roles in so many cool ways. We have young people who are entrepreneurs. We have, you know, artists. There's so many people who have found all of these really cool forms of self-expression and forms to make a mark in our society. And I don't want research as an academics left behind. I don't want that piece of the knowledge ecosystem to be underdeveloped, uh, and it is right now. So we have very low PhD production in Africa and in Kenya. We have very low research output and very personal to me and to our organization at Mawazo is there are very few women in academia, very few women in like the public sphere as leaders. And so we want to help women locally. So you don't have to go away like I did. You don't have to go to the US. You can be in Kenya at a Kenyan university. We give you research funding. We give you training. We give you conference grants. Uh, we help you do a high quality PhD, but we also give you all of this training in communication, in thought leadership, and all of these things so that you are not only an expert, but you're somebody who can go into the world and be part of the conversation about how we solve big problems in Africa. I think I think that's really great. And you're starting to get into what is my next question, um, that the Nairobi Ideas podcast is this home for big ideas and getting these big ideas into the world, uh, particularly the big ideas of African scientists, thinkers, makers, innovators, Africans who often don't get the same platforms to sort of share their ideas or their vision for the world. And we are seeing more of that, which I appreciate and value. So in the spirit of big ideas, what would you say is your big idea? You know, it's so hard to be asked this question after asking so many people that question. <laughs> <laughs> this is very high level, but, you know, you did ask me for a big idea. <laughs> yes, give it to us. <laughs> so I think my big idea and is really what you see manifested in the work of the Mawazo Institute and all of our programs, including this podcast. And in my own work as a energy expert and practitioner is my big idea is that I'd like us to put ideas to work for Africa. You know, with the many challenges we face, we need to fuse creative and inspired thinking with research and evidence. You know, I really see myself as trying to bridge those two worlds, like the worlds that we associate with like dynamic young people, you know, with energy, you know, who are creative, who are hustling, who are doing all of these cool things. I want that fused with like the world of slow, steady thinking, research, really deep thinking, deep knowledge production and bring those together. And and a big part of this for me is, you know, to tap into the underutilized potential of African women and also that of everyday people. This is why, you know, Mawazo has a strong focus on building not just expertise and research capacity among the women we work with, but we also promote public scholarship and thought leadership so that, you know, we're engaging members of the general public in thoughtful discussions on issues and empowering them to be, you know, actively involved in finding solutions. And for me, that is that is it, you know, diversifying the pool of ideas and the people who are ideating and getting them in conversation with, with each other so we can get past this, you know, um, stereotype of, of the university as this kind of old, slow place where there's no energy and no creative thinking is coming out of. I agree with what you're saying here. And I do think that when you look at research overseas, it seems to be a very vibrant part of um, the national fabric. And that doesn't seem to be the same here. Again, there's that hard line between academia and the rest of us, right? Just to preface this, I'll say, you know, academia has challenges all over the world. And we, all over the world, there's an ivory tower syndrome where we're not connecting academia sufficiently with society and all of that stuff. But I will say in other parts of the world, we're seeing much more progress. You know, when I was in the U.S., I remember, take any given issue, no matter how niche it is, you know, there are researchers in the university who are researching it. There are, um, you know, think tankers with an agenda, you know, putting briefs about it. There are think tankers with no apparent agenda, also trying to be objective about it. There are journalists, you know, like the New York Times or Vox might write a long feature about this thing. Any given issue, there's like the knowledge um, ecosystem around it is so rich, you know, and there's so mm -hmm. many people attacking a question from so many different directions and there's so many ways that you can get information and evidence and educate yourself on a topic and mm -hmm. you know what I would like to see is 
more of that here. I want, you know, if somebody is wondering about, I don't know, Managu or whatever, mm -hmm. that, you know, you can tap into the research of, say, Professor Maria, uh, Maria Bukutsa, who is um, a research VC at JQuat and a um, member of the board of Mawazo who studies ind indigenous vegetables. You can learn about it from her, but then you can also read a really long feature in the nation or in the standard that synthesizes this information about this vegetable. What does it mean? What does it have? Should you use it? Or, you know, like uh, that you can also have the like, you know, Managu lobby group pushing it. You know, you can have the Ministry of Agriculture having a campaign about nutrition. I just want to see our local issues, our local topics, having this kind of like really vibrant, dynamic, rich knowledge ecosystems built around them. I like the notion of rich knowledge ecosystems around things like Managu. Um, <laughs> but one of the things that comes up for me, and this is uh, something we've talked about um, within Mawazo, is, you know, what people have as their sources for information. One of the alarming statistics for me was around the fact that majority of parliamentarians, you know, get their policy information from the newspaper. Um, and if you have read a Kenyan newspaper, it's it's a lot of opinions, you know, um, it's not necessarily facts. Um, and so that's that's really concerning. And, and so to hear that this is what you are trying to sort of change and I'm sure there are the actors within this field is is very um, inspiring. Um, and actually one thing I will say also and you know definitely we need much more fact-based reporting. We also need much more fact-based opinions. So I think one thing that we're really interested in 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 Mawazo and something that like storytellers like you help us accomplish is how we infuse facts and personal narrative so that we're not um you know, alien, you know, we're not removing people's lived experiences from the issues and trying to fuse those in ways that make the work relatable and understandable and accessible and also acknowledging that um, facts interact with society and with people. I think that's really important because you're right. Um, policy, research, academia, all of these things are about our lives. Mm -hmm. They're not about space, which even space is about our lives, you know? <laughs> so they really are um, about ourselves and we have to find ways to then connect those personal stories, which is where this podcast, I think, is a great opportunity. So as we sort of relaunch the Nairobi Ideas podcast in August and we are looking ahead and we want to start creating these stories, what do you think people should expect from this next series of episodes from us lots of bad jokes because i'll be the host again <laughs> <laughs> so get ready <laughs> You know, I think more of the same in terms of if you go back to our um, inaugural series that we did uh, last December, interesting people, fresh, crisp conversation, you know, experts sharing their work in ways that are relatable and interesting and exciting, long lens to curate an interesting group of people that have diverse interests and diverse backgrounds that kind of help you learn something new in the upcoming season in particular, we're going to be exploring climate and conservation. And in true Mawazo style, we're not going to do just like a blah, blah, blah climate conservation series. We're going to do so much work. And we already have identified some interesting people who have fresh perspectives that make this subject not just some kind of big topic out there in the stratosphere that really bring it down to us and especially us here in Kenya. Like, what does it mean? Uh, what are our experts thinking? How does this interface in our everyday life? Are there some other people at the grassroots who are tackling this from a kind of completely different vantage point? You know, this is what we're trying to bring to you is all the fresh perspectives on the issues of the day. And as always, we will keep it entirely nerdy. So, <laughs> well, that's what you have to look forward to um, in the next coming episodes, uh, which are going to be launching in August. Uh, so in a couple of weeks you can hear from rose who will have the mic back she's looking at me like she cannot wait you know, to actually, just be back on you're this actually microphone. really good at this maybe we should, yeah, maybe, uh, oh, we should oh, maybe we should do a power sharing please let's let's make sure we have this <laughs> okay, you recorded guys, that i'm really good at this you guys can't well. see this but a handshake is happening <laughs> There's a handshake agreement here in terms okay. of power sharing on the podcast. Yes, 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 perhaps. Um, okay, on that note, Rose, I really thank you so much. I know I know you were hesitant about whether we needed to hear from you, but I think it's important to really get to meet the host and the voice behind any particular podcast because then you trust the person more, you know? Um, so I appreciate you sitting down with me and doing this with me. I will let you have the outro so that, you know, we can share this power balance thing that we've agreed upon effective immediately. If you want to listen to this podcast again, or if you want to hear more from the Nairobi Ideas podcast in the future, you can find us online permanently at www.mawazoinstitute.org slash podcast. You can also subscribe to the Nairobi Ideas podcast on iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you get your podcasts. From all of us here at the Mawazo Institute, bye and keep it nerdy. Bye.